everyone and welcome back. Many people suppose that the annual Sabbaths and feast days observed in ancient Israel were done away by Jesus Christ. But did you know that the early true church continued to keep and observe these annual holy days for more than four centuries after Christ's resurrection? On today's program, we're going to examine what the Bible says about God's annual holy days. In the world of Christianity today, there really isn't much understanding at all or, or teaching about what sin is. Preachers don't teach that sin must be put out of your life. They don't understand God's awesome purpose or the incredible human potential. They don't understand the meaning of things like what it means to be born again or why Christians need the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. They don't understand that God's church today is not here to convert the world, but to proclaim the good news gospel message of the soon coming kingdom of God. Most churches don't believe that Jesus Christ is coming again, and those that do don't really understand the meaning and the purpose behind the second coming of Christ. And do you know why there's so much confusion and disagreement over these fundamental truths? It's because the churches today don't observe God's annual holy days. Let's start our study today in Exodus chapter 12. This, uh, this particular program, uh, it's going to be important for you to read along in your Bible and to see what the Bible says about His annual observances, the ones that God instituted, the ones that God commanded, like I said there, if you examine the teachings of Christian churches today, the general belief is that Jesus Christ came along, He died for the sins of mankind, and, and uh, that was the end. But if you observe the days that God commands in the Bible, you understand and know then that the very first event in God's great plan of salvation is the death of Jesus Christ. That's the beginning. That's not the end of God's plan and purpose. That's just the first of seven annual festivals that God spells out in detail. Not just in the Old Testament, as many assume, but in the New Testament too. We'll see that here today. Exodus 12, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. So just to uh, bring you up to speed with some of the history here, Israel had been in captivity for about two centuries. They were forced to labor under their e Egyptian taskmasters. They lost all track of, of time, of God's weekly Sabbath day, of God's annual holy days. And so God sets them straight right here at the beginning of their exodus of their departure from Egypt, of their coming out of captivity. And God says this day, the Israelites, as I say, were in bondage. Verse 3 continues, Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So on the tenth day they were to take a lamb, it says here, and then uh, a few days later, on the 14th, they were to uh, kill the Passover lamb. And then if you're familiar with the story, of course, uh, down in verse 22, picking it up uh, midway through, it says, Strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is uh, in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. So they were to spread the blood over the, the, the door post. Then you can read in, in uh, verse 29 that they were to, to stay in their homes that evening, all through that night. Uh, 
And, and God, verse 30, goes on and says that uh, he smote the firstborn in Egypt. Pharaoh uh, then rose up in the middle of the night. There was a great outcry, of course. He called for Moses and Aaron, and he told them to get out of Egypt, to go. And, and then the verses that follow, verse 35 and onward, it talks about the Israelites borrowing or spoiling from the Egyptians, taking all sorts of goods with them as they made their their departure from Egypt, picking it up again midway through verse 41, it says, Even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It's a night to be much observed unto the Eternal for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Eternal to be observed, a night to be much observed. So they had this, this festival, this uh, Passover on the 14th of the first month according to the Hebrew calendar. And then the very next night, as other verses bring out, they departed from, uh, from Egypt. They fled captivity. Let's look at the book of Numbers, Numbers 28. So much of what we're covering here today, uh, by the way, is discussed in this wonderful little booklet, Pagan Holidays or God's Holy Days, which, which, I mean, this is an important booklet for you to study because it helps you understand whether or not it matters which days you keep and observe. Does it really matter? Well, read this book and learn if it does and understand what God says about His annual festivals. Like all that we offer on this program, we'll give you this little booklet for free at no cost or obligation to you. Just call one of our operators today and we'll send out a copy of Pagan Holidays or God's Holy Days, which I don't often talk uh, enough about our magazine as well, but everyone that calls this program requesting any of our literature, we just automatically sign you up to become a subscriber to the Philadelphia Trumpet Magazine. You get a full one-year subscription to the Trumpet Magazine. You get it in your mailbox, 10 issues per year. That's important to understand your world. This really does help you understand what's happening in this crazy and evil and, and in so many ways violent world that we live in today. So picking it up here in Numbers, this is Numbers 28, verse 17, it says, And in the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover of the Eternal, and in the fifteenth day of this month is the feast. Seven days, seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. You can read much the same thing in Leviticus 23 where God spells out all of these annual festivals where he talks about his seven annual holy days. It's spelled out in great detail there in Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23 but to just focus on uh, these first two that come right close together at the start of the Hebrew calendar year. You have the Passover to begin with and then right after that, right after that, uh, beginning with uh, the evening or the sunset that marked their departure from Egypt, the night to be much observed, you enter into that, that holy day, that seven-day festival, the days of unleavened bread. Let's go back to Exodus 12, just a few pages back. Exodus 12, and uh, backing up to verse 16, we left off in verse 42 earlier. It says, And in the first day uh, there shall be an holy convocation, in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. And then verse 17 says, And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Now I'll leave it to you to look up that word convocation in the dictionary. It's talking about a, a sacred assembly where the presence of God's people is commanded. And it's preceded by the word holy there. Holy. God calls this holy, sacred uh, convocation. He says, you come together and assemble before me. And it's important to note here that this was before the ceremonial law of Moses was even instituted. There are those who want to say this was part of that ceremonial law and that it was set aside later once the New Testament church was established. This happened before that before the ceremonial laws were instituted. God is talking about you memorialize these days so that you don't forget 
or as we'll read later, so that your children don't forget these important days. This was to be a memorial of their deliverance from Egypt, their supernatural deliverance. And the thing of it is, as the New Testament brings out, it's a wonderful picture of our deliverance from sin. That's what Egypt is a type of in your Bible. You can see that in Hebrews 11. It's a type of sin. And spiritually speaking, we come out of Egypt. And it takes a miracle. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ, for sure, that sacrifice. But what do we do? What do we do after that? Where do we go from there? Is the sacrifice itself an end? Or is it just the beginning? Do do we act on something because of that awesome sacrifice? Because of that shed blood? Just like the Israelites of old. I mean, God wants to keep us constantly. uh, He wants to keep us constantly in mind of, of this awesome, awesome plan of salvation which begins with that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And from there, we are to, just like the Israelites did anciently, we're to go out or to come out of sin. This world, Egypt, Babylon, it's also called in Revelation 18, come out of sin. And all of this, of course, this coming out of sin, it's, it's pictured by the days of unleavened bread. Now, at least there's, a, there's a, a somewhat of a familiarity with the term Passover in our modern world. Very few people, however, uh, have ever heard of the Days of Unleavened Bread, the second festival that's talked about in Leviticus 23 and Exodus 12. And as we'll see after the break, in the New Testament as well, in Paul's writings, it's in the Gospels. It's right there in your own Bible. That's why, as I said earlier, you've got to go and get your Bible and read these verses for yourself. I just want to remind you again of this free booklet that's going to go into quite a lot more detail than what we have time to cover here today. Pagan holidays or God's holy days, which? Which? Does it matter which days you observe? It certainly does. It certainly does. So make sure that you stay tuned and write down all the information that you need to secure your free copy of this wonderful little booklet. We'll be right back. Does it make any difference which days we observe? or whether we keep them? Does the Bible establish whether we are to keep certain days holy to God? Were these days given to ancient Israel only? Are they binding today only on the Jewish people, while Christians are commanded to keep holidays such as Christmas and Easter? Request our free booklet, Pagan Holidays or God's Holy Days, which? All of our literature is free and will be sent to you with no cost or obligation. Call the number on your screen and order this free booklet today. still in Exodus here. Let's, let's uh, move a little forward to Exodus 13 and, and begin to understand the significance of these festivals that God instituted. This is Exodus 13. Why did God ordain these feast days in the first place? What's the purpose behind it all? Verse 3, it says, And uh, Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt. Don't forget. Don't forget this day. Make it a memorial. Observe it every single year so that you never forget. Verse 6 goes on and says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. That's bread that's flat, bread without leavening. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the eternal. So you have the Passover on the 14th, and then the days of unleavened bread beginning on the 15th, starting at sunset and continuing for seven days, the first day of which is a holy day, a holy annual Sabbath, and then the seventh day also, an annual Sabbath, a holy convocation where God's people are commanded to assemble together. Verse 8 says, And you shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Eternal did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. Here's why we're keeping these days, son. This is why we observe these festivals. He wants our children to know and understand, it says, and it shall uh, be for a sign unto you 
upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand has the Eternal brought you out of Egypt. God performed a miracle, many miracles, in bringing them out. And He does the same in bringing us out of this dying world. Verse 10 continues, uh, You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. You see, it was to be a memorial and it was a sign. It's also something that points to the future. It has a future meaning, in other words. That's what a sign is. It, it points ahead. And again, you can round out your study by looking into the New Testament and see that the Passover, as it's observed in the Christian church today, the Passover pictures the death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, as He's called in the Bible, for the remission of our sins, our past sins. But you see where so many people uh, get off track is they assume that accepting the blood of Jesus Christ then gives us the license to go on and continue in sin or to stay in Egypt, so to speak. But if you understand, again, the meaning of these seven annual festivals, you know that that's not what God teaches. God teaches us to come out of sin. Now, even in the true Christian church, certainly, uh, there are sinners. We are all sinners. But the process of salvation is one of coming out of sin, of repenting from sin, of turning away from sin, and following after God and His way of life. Just as those Israelites anciently were to follow that pillar cloud in the wilderness. Now let's go over to the New Testament. As I say, it's important for you to read along here. This is 1 Corinthians 5. This is one of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the brethren at Corinth. This is primarily a Gentile congregation. I mean, they hadn't grown up in Judaism. They weren't familiar with all these Jewish festivals just because of their upbringing. They had no knowledge of that prior to coming into the church. And yet, notice what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. It says, Your glorying is not good. They had allowed sin to stay in their congregation instead of getting it out, as the Bible commands. Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Leaven is a type of sin, and it just fills the entire loaf. And that's why for that, that annual festival, the Days of Unleavened Bread, the Israelites were to remove leavening from their homes. Verse 7 goes on and says, again, giving us the beautiful picture here, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Jesus Christ, Paul says to them, is our Passover. And so we observe the Passover today. The symbols were changed. Jesus himself changed those symbols. But we continue to observe this annual memorial, this holy convocation. Verse 8 says, Therefore, in other words, because Christ is our Passover, verse 8 says, Therefore let us keep the feast. Which feast? Well, the one that follows right after Passover. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now that's pretty plain language. Because Jesus Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed, Paul says, let's keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Do you know when he wrote this? This is around 55 A.D. This is almost 25 years after the crucifixion. Almost 25 years after the establishment of the true church. What has happened in the world of Christianity? Why is it so different from what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 5, in 1 Corinthians 10, in 1 Corinthians 11. Why is it so different? Well, that's something that you need to study. That's why you want to go and, and uh, call for this booklet. You want to really dig into this and go into it in depth so that God can open your mind and help you see which days you ought to be, you should be uh, observing. Because of this Passover sacrifice, we go on from there and keep the days of unleavened bread. We don't stay in sin. We come out of it. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. 
Uh, and as you turn over there, let me just give you a quote from this wonderful booklet, Pagan Holidays or God's Holy Days, which Mr. Armstrong says, while the Israelites were in Egypt, they were Pharaoh's slaves, helpless and powerless under his taskmasters, just as the sinner is in the power of the devil. But when Israel took the blood of the lamb, then God acted. And as a result, Pharaoh released Israel. When we accept Christ's blood, God acts and the devil must release us. Now, doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that then blend these two testaments together perfectly? You can understand the Old Testament. You can understand why they went through what they did. Because as Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 10, it's, it's all for us that we might learn and understand and know by their example why we're here, what we're coming out of, where we go. You go back to that history we've touched on in Exodus 12 and 13. Then in Exodus 14, here's another beautiful analogy or picture of what we experience today. The Israelites, as you know, fled from Egypt. They took off toward the Red Sea. Pharaoh had a change of heart. God hardened his heart, it says. And then Pharaoh and his armies chased after them and had the Israelites cornered between a mountain range and the Red Sea. And they were fearful. They were in a, a hopeless situation. They cried out to God for deliverance. And Moses said, stand back and see the salvation of the eternal. Watch God intervene. And God did. He parted the waters of the Red Sea and they escaped. The devil's not going to give up. When God, when God releases us from captivity by that shed blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb, we've got to act on that and, and move and follow God, but the devil's going to be relentless in coming after us. And we're going to need God's help and power to overcome and to conquer. That's why we need the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit. These are things, as I said at the top, that, that, that are misunderstood in the world of traditional Christianity. This is talking about that Exodus 14 uh, escape. Helpless, we're told to stand still and see the salvation of the eternal. He shall fight for us. We can't conquer Satan and sin, but he can. It's the risen Christ, our high priest, who will cleanse us, sanctify us, deliver us, who said he would never leave us nor forsake us. We can't keep the commandments in our own power and strength, but Christ in us can keep them. We must rely on him in faith. See, we can't do it on our own, but Christ in us can. Matthew 19, uh, 26, I think it is. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, through the power of God's Spirit, through the living Jesus Christ. Well, 1 Corinthians 10 here, we really don't have time to read all of it, but it talks about in verses 1 and 2, Don't be ignorant of our history, how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses or unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I mean, this is obviously, obviously talking about the events in Exodus 12, 13, and 14. And what's the purpose? What's the real meaning here? Look at verse 6. Now these things, this history, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. I mean, they went into the wilderness. They didn't have God's Spirit. God was proving a point. But they went into the wilderness and got caught up in all kinds of sin. And Paul says here, the lesson is for us, that we don't get caught up in the things that they did. And how do you do it? Well, you do it by getting baptized, as it says there in the first couple of verses, and, and then receiving the power of God's Spirit, and then walking by faith, following God, drawing on that power to overcome and to conquer. Let's just hurry over to the, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12, and again, just to make this point in conclusion, that these were days that the New Testament Christians observed. Jesus kept them. The apostles did. Acts 12 and verse 3, it says, And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now why would God inspire this in Acts 12 and verse 3? Why would he mention the days of unleavened bread if they had long since been set aside, if they weren't being observed by true Christians in that time? Well, he mentions it, obviously, because they were being kept and observed by God's people. 
Notice the next verse. It says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. That's the only time in the Bible the word Easter is mentioned. And did you know it comes from the Greek word pasha, which means Passover, and that there's no relation at all between Easter and Passover? Just look into both observances yourself. Here, this is a gross mistranslation. And as I say, it's the only time you even see that word in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. (laughs) Notice this quote here from uh, Ralph Woodrow. He says, From where then did Easter observance come? Did the early Christians die Easter eggs? Did Peter or Paul ever conduct an Easter sunrise service? The answers are, of course, obvious. It's obvious. And look, it's talked about at length in this wonderful booklet. Make sure that you stay tuned and request your free copy of Pagan Holidays or God's Holy Days, which. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.